everybody. Happy September. Um, today is September 2nd and um, my name is Robin. I'm coming to you from uh, North Carolina in the United States and it's been a while since my last um, podcast, which I expected. Uh, August turned out to be an extremely busy month, but uh, with the Labor Day weekend here in the States, I thought I'd take a minute to, a few minutes to try to catch up with everybody and uh, share some stuff about my knitting. You can find me as The Flock over on uh, Ravelry, and I have a uh, blog where I put all the uh, um, show notes, um, Mama Flock Knits, and I'm Willow Caroline over on Instagram, and I'll put that information down below. So you can find me, especially if you have any questions about the things I've made or the things I'm talking about. So today I thought I'd start off with the only finished object I have. Um, as I said, August was a busy month. First, my college-age son had to get back to Clemson University, so there was a lot of goodbying and packing and um, getting him ready for his junior year. And then both my oldest and my middle son had birthdays, so we had family birthday celebrations, cake, and actually pie. My guys aren't real cake fans, so um, apple pie and uh, nice dinners with everybody around. And it was also time to do all that back to school doctor visits. So I had mammogram and the mammogram always sees something funny. And so then I have to go in and have another uh, ultrasound. Everything's fine. And I went to the dermatologist, um, you know, after you're 50, you grew up in, I grew up in Texas in the summer sun, so it's a good idea to get that yearly um, check for skin issues, and I had a little place frozen and a little place uh, biopsied, but it's all good. <laughs> to the eye doctor, ooh, the eyes are a little different, so I'll be getting new glasses soon. And it was the same for my youngest son, getting him to the eye doctor and to the doctor. And lots of appointments. And of course, I went back to work full time. I'm a high school math teacher, so the 18th was our very first day officially, but the two weeks before in August, I was setting up a classroom, meeting with colleagues, uh, doing lots of plans, and I have a particularly full load this year. Um, it seems like every year I say that, because every year it gets a little bit worse. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so I've been busy. And then uh, on the first day of school, we have big faculty meetings. And we were doing the typical trainings, um, things that you need to know as a, a, a teacher these days. And one of those was an EpiPen training. And we were told that um, they had lots of trainers this year. Because an EpiPen, if you don't know, if a, if a student goes into anaphylactic shock, here in the state of North Carolina, we are allowed to administer the EpiPen regardless of if they have a doctor's note or not. Um, and it takes a little bit of force to, you know, you're not just being gentle, you're um, really applying it um, into the thigh area, the muscle of the thigh, with a, a little bit of force, and it's good to practice that. And we were told we had trainers that had no needles in them, and I was busy helping a student teacher. I have a student teacher this year, I was helping a student teacher, and then I also have a, I'm a mentor to a teacher that's new to the school, just not new to teaching. So I was answering their questions and doing stuff and I grabbed the trainer and boom, I just practiced in my hand. It turned out it wasn't a trainer, it was an actual EpiPen. So big needle into my hand, median nerve probably. Um, <laughs> gonna be unhappy for a little while, so I have numb spots here in my thumb and I'm still finding it difficult to use, so I have been knitting um, the past week and a half or so with uh, a brace on to try to keep this from moving a whole lot, and but the tip of my thumb is a little bit numb, so that is very annoying <laughs> when I'm knitting. Um, it is much better. The big bruise in the middle of my palm is gone, and I felt silly, and of course... The people during the training felt mortified. Funny story is though, last year somebody did the exact same thing. Even though last year we were told, be careful, these aren't trainers, they have needles in them, so just look them over. And somebody 
did it. So at least I don't feel that stupid because um, I had been told that they were um, trainers. Now, I didn't take the time to look at the EpiPen itself. I should have because the trainers all say trainer in great big letters on the side. I just grabbed one off the table and and nobody knew that it was um, there was one that was live. The fun part was the racing heart. I got some epinephrine, the racing heart, and then I was sitting there in the faculty meeting trying to take notes like this, and my colleagues were laughing. I was, just, I, was a, I was a fun back to school joke for a week. All that being said, I do have one finished object that I'm really excited about, and that's my Lady Brunswick sweater. So if you are at all interested on more details about the knitting of the sweater, I did talk about it in the other two podcasts that I've made, and I have lots of notes over on Rav Ravelry. But this is a sweater designed by somebody from North Carolina, uh, Joan Beebe. Uh, I think her pattern company is called SS Knits. I had gone to the Carolina Wool and Sheep Festival several years ago and seen it in person and thought it was just the most lovely thing ever. Bought the pattern, um, eventually bought the yarn, and eventually got around to knitting it. It is made with Malabrigo yarn, Malabrigo Arroyo, um, in two different colors, Indecito and Sand maybe, but again, all the details are on Ravelry. It is an extremely well written pattern. The um, pattern comes with video links for learning how to do the Latvian braid which is on the top and on the sleeve. And here at the bottom, it has that sort of stepped back, um, stepped uh, lower, lower back than front, which I like. Little side slits. It has this nice cabled piece in the middle. And the yarn, the Malabrigo yarn, is so soft and squishy and buttery. It was just a pleasure to knit. I hope it's going to hold up well um, when I wear it. I'm sure there'll be some pilling, but I'm so looking forward to wearing it. It fits really well. Um, and like I said, the pattern was so well written. You start at the bottom, you knit up, you start at the back, and you knit up, you start at the front, and you knit up, and then you do the joining up here, and then you cast on the sleeves. And because the pattern's so well written, um, it just came together like a dream. So this is my first finished object, and I just am thrilled with it. I haven't blocked it yet. This is non-blocked, so I'm gonna go wash it and hope it doesn't like bloom way way longer or bigger than it is. Because right now it fits just beautifully, but I'm gonna have to wash it sometime. So. After this video, it's on my list of Labor Day weekend things to do. I will be blocking it, but yay, I'm so excited to get this finished. Um, and my husband has surprised me with a trip this October. Um, I have a cousin that lives in New York, and she has friends that have access to a house near Rhinebeck. And so my husband has gotten me a ticket to fly up there and go to Rhinebeck. It will be the first ever time I have taken off of school for a personal fun reason. All the other times I've taken off have been through... I take that back. I actually took off one time to um, one day to go to the cousin's wedding um, when she got married. Other than that, it's all been sickness or my my pa emergencies with my parents, not not fun stuff. So I'm thrilled. I'm looking. I'm I'm so excited to go do that. No idea what it's gonna be like, but I I have a Rhinebeck sweater, I guess, because I can take this and wear this. All right, finished object. Only finished object to talk about today. So, what have I been working on in my limited time? I've done a little bit of knitting on my socks. They have traveled with me to all the doctor's appointments, um, but they don't look substantially different. I haven't like progressed from sock number one to sock number two or anything on that. So um, 
let's take a look at a few of the things that I am working on now that the Lady Brunswick sweater is done. And the first would be my three color cashmere shawl that I've shown you before. I think last time I showed it to you, it was just a teeny baby bit of a shawl. I think I had just done, um, I think I had just done the very bottom few stripes, the big solid ones at the bottom. And since then, I've done the middle set of stripes. Um, what's nice about this pattern is while it looks fairly complex, each of the sections are fairly easy to memorize. So like this middle stripes section, you could just pack it and, and go. And um, didn't even need the pattern with me. I knew what I was doing, just straight knitting back and forth. Um, easy to know, to know how many rows to count. Um, you just did a certain number of stripes. So that was um, easy. This part has also been um, added since then and very easy again to knit without having to read the pattern. And I have one single row left on this section before I go back and put on what is the uh, lacy edge. So I have done this portion I'm just about finished with this green portion, so now I will do this part, and I suspect this will be a little, uh, need a little more concentration. But I'm very excited to be getting close to, um, to have made that much progress on it in the limited time that I've had in August. This is, again, the Three Color Cashmere Shawl. It's by Hohi Locatelli. I'm knitting it out of Veil, which is um, the lace weight yarn by Brooklyn Tweed. And the colors are Norway, Heron, and I can't remember, I think Snow or s Cloud or something. Again, on my Ravelry page. And I, I'm enjoying using the yarn, but I think the shawl is designed for more of a fingering weight than a lace weight yarn. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this blocks out. But I was looking for something that I could just throw around and wear over a shirt for school. Um, and I think it's gonna it's gonna turn out to be just that. So the colors are are grayish and white, and I'm really enjoying knitting it. And I can't wait to block it and stretch it all out. It's kind of um, hard to get the full effect when it's on the needles like this. I do have concerns about the edge. I've been trying to knit the edge very loosely, and it seems to me like it's still maybe will cause me issues. I haven't really worked out in my head how this is going to pin out when I go to block it, but you know, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. So this is probably the thing I've been knitting on the most since the Lady Brunswick shawl, and I'm sort of divided. I'm not really sure if I'm gonna just all out try to just get this done or if I'm going to divide my time between two other projects that are very important to me that I need to get going on. Plus, then there's the whole idea of Christmas knitting. My oldest son uh, saw me making some hats for uh, my middle son and his girlfriend. I made them matching uh, orange and purple um, winter beanies for Christmas because... In, school colors, rah, 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 um, and my oldest son said, hey, you know, I kind of like one. He's not, he's not in college anymore, so I'm thinking Dallas cowboy colors because that's his favorite, so I got to get on to some Christmas knitting, but I'm so close to getting this finished, and I would like to have it once the weather here turns cool, which it actually ended up being, sorry, I'm tangled up in yarn, it actually ended up being a very mild uh, summer for the most part. We had we had a couple of weeks of really intense heat, which is great because it's the sum it's south, the southern United States, and you expect that. But it's already cooled off, and the reason I'm in here today is because, um, like the old nursery rhyme says, it's a misty, moisty morning when cloudy was the weather. That's uh, still foggy. Um, in mid-morning outside and all my guys went to the tractor show 
and I said, no thanks, I'm not going to tromp around in the mud at the, <laughs> the tractor show for several hours. We've, I guess, got the remnants of the front that um, resulted from Hurricane Harvey, which just hit the um, coast down in Texas. And that has also been taking up a lot of our time and attention. My husband and I are from Houston, and my parents still live in Houston, and we have lots of family friends and some relatives all around the area. And the good news is for most everybody, including my parents, they are sufficiently okay. My parents had water higher than they've ever had in their yard, but nothing actually came into their house. And when they released the water from the reservoirs, they are far enough away from those rivers that were affected that, that they didn't get the secondary flooding that many people did get, even if they survived the first rounds of flooding. Um, so my parents are good, which is great, because my mom is paralyzed and my dad is elderly, her caregiver, and I just know that if they'd had to have, um, if they'd had to leave, it would have been an involved kind of rescue situation. But they had plenty of food. They never lost power. They did lose phone for a while, but no power loss, plenty of food, and they just hung out. And the water has receded from their neighborhood. They can get a few places at this point. Um, so we were very glad that, that they were okay. So turning my attention uh, to two important projects, the first one I'm going to talk about is my son's Clemson football scarf. So when my son was going to Clemson for the first year, freshman year, he asked me, when your 18-year-old son asks you to knit him something, you just do it. He asked me to knit him a hat um, to wear to the football games. And he wanted an ear flap kind of hat. And he wanted Clemson colors. And then he'd seen some sort of loose designs um, that he liked. And so I made him... I made him a hat, which you can find on my Ravelry page, and maybe I'll stick a picture in here somewhere um, to show you what that hat looked like. And I had no idea uh, how much yarn I was going to need. It was all kind of a make it up as I go, pattern here, pattern here, borrow from this, borrow from that, make it up as I go kind of thing. Not to mention the orange color that Clemson uses is not everybody's standard color. So my local yarn shop um, ordered me the orange and they have to order it in sets of 10. Um, so I decided I would just purchase extra. I'd purchase extra um, in, ca you know, in case I needed it and because I felt bad that they'd special ordered this bright orange that maybe nobody else would ever use. So um, this is Cascade. Um, sorry ball is falling off. Cascade 220 fingering weight yarn and I got it in the um, this purple I mean this orange and this purple because those are the Clemson colors and white and I knit him the hat and I had so much yarn left over that I said I'll just knit him a matching scarf to go with it. I didn't have a particular pattern in mind and I just decided to start knitting in the round. And I started knitting uh, watching football. I have never really watched football in my life. I know I've just confessed I came from Houston, Texas. I played in the high school marching band. But I've never been a football fanatic where I have to watch football games on TV. But I was watching the football games because I thought, I'll see my son in the crowd. Never seen him on the TV. But... The first two years of Eli's existence at Clemson, oh my goodness, the football team did great things. Last year they won the national championship. Yay, yay, yay. And so I just made this my football knitting watching scarf. It was easy, just stockinette. When the team's doing great, I feel like I've got the right color. When they start having a problem, I feel like maybe the color is jinxing them, so I change color. I got the crazy notion that if I wasn't knitting, they weren't going to do well. So I was always knitting and knitting like a mad person. Um, put the tiger paw there. And I just kind of go and go until the season's over and then I put it away. 
So um, it's double sided. I made it as a tube. So it's going to be extremely warm. And I don't know how long I'm going to make it because <laughs> this is a great giant overkill of a, of a scarf, basically. But he loves it. And he loves the idea that I'm knitting on it. So I'm thinking at least one more football season, which does happen to start today. <sighs> Although the kickoff time is like at noon. And I'm meeting a colleague at work at noon, too to work, get ready for next school week. But hopefully I'll get home and get to see part of the game and hopefully they'll do fine while I'm not knitting. And so I just plan to keep going. And again, I'm just doing whatever the mood strikes me as. I just look at it, decide on another color, and I have, I have, I don't know what I was thinking because I have plenty, plenty, plenty of this fingering weight yarn left to probably double the length of the scarf. I don't know. But he loves it. I love it because I feel a little connection with him while I'm knitting it. And I don't feel like I've wasted my afternoon watching football if I get some progress made. So this is coming out of its bag and will get some attention. I probably should put a progress keeper on here so that I can see how much this year's pro progress is. I think the first year I was only up to somewhere here. So this was all last year. Um, but maybe I should do that. And then I don't know, do I, do I finish it this year and give it to him for his senior year so he can wear it? Um, or do I knit on it his senior year and give it to him afterwards as a memory scarf? Maybe I'll ask him what he would like me to do. So that's the first project that will be getting a lot of attention now. And the second project is a sweater for my husband. So my husband wanted me to knit him a sweater. He's bought sweaters. Um, he's um, He has trouble finding a good fit that isn't too baggy or that the sweater doesn't bag over time. So... He asked me to knit him a sweater, and I let him pick out the yarn without really paying attention to what he was picking. So this is Brooklyn Tweed pattern. I can't remember who. Maybe Michelle Wang. Anyway, it's called the Longfellow Sweater. It's a very well-written pattern, but it's a fingering weight yarn. So he bought, he picked out, he wanted a specific color of red. He didn't want um, that fire engine red or that bright Christmas red. He wanted more of a, he wanted this color. This is the color that he wanted. It's got undertones of black. It's a little bit darker. It's, it's not, um, it's not real bright red. And he really wanted this color, and this was about the only yarn we could find in this color. And I just got it without really thinking about it, but it's a fairly fine fingering weight yarn. And it's got some alpaca in it, and I forget the name of the yarn, because I made this sweater a while ago. I'll put it down below, or I'll put it in the show notes, but... He likes it, he likes the sweater, he likes the fit. Everything came together just fine on the sweater, but it feels a little bit delicate. You know, it feels like he's gonna, he feels like he's gonna poke a hole in it or something, and it really isn't. It's very sturdy, um, but he just feels like it's more delicate. So, while he loves the sweater, and he's worn it enough, he wore it enough last spring and, and winter that it's got pills all over it. I need to go <laughs> need to go fix all the pills. That um, I decided I would just start another sweater, same pattern, but out of the yarn that it was intended for because our local yarn shop became a Brooklyn Tweed carrier, carries the Brooklyn Tweed yarn. So this is Brooklyn Tweed Loft. And it's in a dark blue. I picked this out for him, so he didn't have a say in the color. Um, I picked it out for him, 
and it has a, a much more substantial feel to it while still at the same time being lightweight. So that was one of his conditions. He really wanted a lightweight sweater. Uh, we live in the south. Our buildings are well heated. A lot of time we don't even wear a coat. We just run to the car and complain how cold it is as we run to the car. <laughs> but it's, it's, <laughs> it's just what we do. Um, so anyway, I started knitting him this um, last March in the hopes that maybe it would happen for his birthday, which was in March. But of course it didn't happen for his birthday and then it got to be hot summertime and I was distracted by other things. But now I need to get back to it. It's got these lovely pockets that you can see that haven't been stitched. There's the back flap of the pocket. It's got a very nice ribbing at the bottom, but otherwise it's a very simple, nicely fitted, slim, modern cardigan. I've got the two fronts done. I've got a sleeve finished, and these are all finished and blocked to measurement. Um, and in my knitting to go bag, I have most of the back, but this hasn't been pulled out in a while. Most of the back done. I'm well, I don't have most of the back done. I have a lot of the back done. I'm almost to the point where I will do the armholes. So then after this would be one more sleeve. Finish the back, the other sleeve, put it together. Now, once you put it together, there's this band, the, the button band. It goes, you have to go all up the front, around the neck, down the other side. It takes forever. So I really get, I gotta put some energy into this if he's gonna wear it at all this fall slash winter. But he really loves it. The other thing he wanted on that first sweater is he wanted elbow patches. And we decided in the end that the sweater felt too de delicate for the elbow patches, even though I think they would be fine on there. But we're going to put, this is much, um, much sturdier. So we're going to put the elbow patches on this one, on the sleeve. Doesn't it look like it just needs elbow patches? Oh, it's kind of a tweedy, beautiful blue color. And... Um, so this again is Loft by Brooklyn Tweed and it's in the Almanac colorway. Almanac, Almanac colorway. And we've also got some fancy schmancy. Um, we've got a color, a couple of options for elbow patches. Not yet quite sure how that's going to happen, but we'll get them on there. And we've got some fancy leather buttons for the sweater. I don't know if you can see them very well. Um, that we got online from the website AsCuteAsAButton.com. We had we, we looked everywhere for buttons. The original version of the sweater also has some really nice leather buttons. Slightly different. So these are his nice sweaters. And you know, if your husband asks you to knit him something, your 18-year-old son does, your 24-year-old son does, you're gonna knit something for them because it's a good excuse to get. Um, so yeah, the, um, <laughs> to do the, to do the band around the, uh, the button band around the sweater takes a 47 inch needle. Never had such a long needle in my life. Um, but I'm going to use it for the second one, the second sweater, so I got a good use out of them. So anyway, again, this is um, a pattern um, that I got from the Brooklyn Tweed Company. Here is the, here is the picture of it. 
It's a very nice, simple cardigan, just what my husband wanted. And he's really enjoyed the first one, so I, I think he's going to get a lot of use out of the second one. I was trying to find the name of the actual designer. Um, all of these patterns are so well written. They're a thousand pages long, but they're well written. And again, this is a pattern where there are lots of new to me techniques that I um, that I have been learning, but they're well um, they're well laid out in the pattern itself. But I don't I don't see the. I think it's Wang. If I find, I'll put it down below when I go to edit everything. So that is pretty much it right now for works in progress. So far on uh, these videos, I have shown you a couple of things that I have um, gotten from my grandmother, my um, or my grandmother's, I should say. I have my father's mother, who was a knitter, and she lived in California. We lived in Texas. She'd come visit every every two years, usually, for a long extended visit. And when I was very young, six or seven, she first taught me to knit, and I'd be all enthusiastic and knitting with her, and then she'd leave, and I'd keep knitting until I got stuck. And then it would have to wait until she came back. And um, then she would renew my interest and teach me another new thing, and then she'd go away again. So she is the woman responsible for my love of knitting, and I have inherited from her when she passed away uh, all of her knitting needles and things like that that she used for knitting, which I'm very, very grateful for. And then my mother's mother, my um, maternal grandmother, is still alive. She's 96, living in a um, nursing facility in Texas, and she was the one who taught me to sew. She's also very crafty. She was somebody who liked arts and crafts in general. I am somebody who likes to make things that I will use. I'm not so much, um, I don't like to make little bits and bobs that go on top of, for decorations and stuff. That's not so much me, but that was definitely my grandmother. She painted things, holiday themed things, wreaths for the door. Um, she sewed. I don't think she ever knitted or crocheted, really. She came up with a new theme for the Christmas tree every year and then made ornaments and all the things that went on the tree. One year it was nursery rhymes, one year it was um, one year it had to do with sweets or something like that. So there were little ice cream cones that she'd made all over the tree. She'd just come up with these interesting themes and then she'd make all the ornaments. And my sister and I were her only two grandchildren and she just doted on us. <sighs> Sorry about that. A neighbor just came by and so I had to go answer the door. Anyway, I was talking about my maternal grandmother and her love of arts and crafts. Um, so she taught me how to sew, and I'm grateful for those lessons. And she also ta taught me how to cook and a lot about gardening. But it was my um, paternal grandfather, a uh, paternal grandmother, who was the one who left me with a love of knitting and crochet. And I have some of her things. And so today I thought I'd share with you two of her needle cases. Um, we've all been... Um, if you watch um, other podcasts or look on Instagram, there are lots of new needle cases and things, double DPN holders and things that people are making. But this is how my grandmother carried her knitting needles. So the first thing I have is this plaid, um, sort of vinyl-y, plasticky roll that when you untie and open, houses um, a large selection of the needles that I have been left. Um, there are lots of metallic ones in all sorts of different sizes. Some plastic ones and 
Um, I think most of these are needles made by Boy, B-O-Y-E. I don't think you'll be able to see that. But anyway, a large variety, different sizes. This folds over the top, and then you roll it back up, and you tie it around with the ribbon. So that was one of the two um, needle cases that I received when my cousins were clearing out her uh, things after she passed away. And the second one is one that's personalized and looks like it was handmade. Um, I don't know if she made it or if somebody made it and gave it to her, but these are her initials. And her name was Lillian Maxine. But she went by Maxine. She chose that name. And Lillian, I love the name Lillian. And I thought if I'd ever had a daughter, that would have been a name I would have loved to have used. And I always wondered, even as a small child, nothing against the name Maxine, but if you had such a beautiful name like Lillian, why wouldn't you use it? Especially if it was your first name. But she did not like that name. She liked the name Maxine. And maybe it was a, seemed to her a more modern um, name in the 50s, but... She was a very interesting woman. She preferred her children at one point to call her Maxine rather than call her mom, which my son, my, my middle son in particular, likes to tease me and call me by my first name, and it irritates me because, you know, I, I earned that title. I'm mom. Better call me mom. But anyway, this is kind of a... I don't even know what kind of fabric it is. It's a little bit of a... It's sturdy, but it feels a little silky, and it's got a, shine, a sheen to it. And then you open it up, and you have all these wonderful pockets. There's pockets here for, um, these are some very old needle tips that I think don't even have much um, give to them anymore. I think they're some form of old rubber. But you have a couple of those pockets for stitch markers and such. Um, there's a button in that one. And here... Um, clearly she was perhaps making um, pom-poms um, and then this is a, a safety pen with it looks like some stitch markers or something on them they're just brass circles that came with it so pockets and then this pocket covers up again just this huge selection of needles that she had this is looks like just plain old seam tape that has been sewn down um, and the whole thing has been edged with some sort of, uh, you know, could be bias binding. But this was her needle case and I am very, um, very happy to be the caretaker of it now. And like I've said before in previous episodes, I have a really difficult time buying new needles when I already when I've been given so many needles, and yet we aren't using a lot of these straight needles for things anymore. A lot of patterns nowadays, we use circular needles or DPNs or, I don't know. But when I can use them, I do, and I enjoy them very much. So that's my something vintage to share with you today. And the last thing I thought I'd do would, um, is ask another what would you do question. So I have been knitting socks for years. And some of these socks I don't even think got on Ravelry ever. Maybe they did. But I'm hard on my socks. I live in the country-ish. And we have a lot of land. And I remember... One day we were doing a small bonfire at the pond and it was starting to creep a little bit away from where we wanted the fire to burn. And my husband said, go down there and fill up the bucket of water. And so I was over at the pond filling it up and I looked down and I'm wearing my garden boots and my garden clogs. They aren't even boots, um, not even completely clothes. Garden clogs and wool, wool socks. And I'm down in the water actually getting the water out of the pond and thinking, you know, it took a lot of time to knit those socks, and here I am running around in them like they're, you know, inexpensive socks from the Walmarts. But in any case, I have three pairs 
of socks that I knit at some point in time a while ago that at some point in time have become damaged. So this first pair I knit um, a lovely cuff pattern, lovely yarn, fits real well, has a lovely heel, and this sock not so bad. Um, there wasn't enough yarn. I think this was jitterbug yarn. I can't remember, but I think that's what it was. The skein, the skein didn't have enough to actually complete the toe, so I used some leftover from something else. So this isn't a patch. This is just, they didn't, I didn't have enough to make them for my long feet. And so I just grabbed something that I thought would, would work. And here's the second sock. with a great big old hole in the bottom. And that's usually where I wear out my socks. I don't tend to burst through the heels. It's right here. Not even the toes. The toes don't come out, but it's underneath the foot. So this patch to me, probably not too bad. I could probably cut it out, re-knit with some, doesn't even have to match, it's the bottom of the foot. And then I'd have a usable pair of socks again. Is it worth the time? Probably for these socks, I would say yes. But what would you do? Because um, a lot of work went into this leaf pattern, and they're pretty. And this part is all in, in the shoe anyway. So there's those. Then there are these. I loved these. They are leaf lace socks. I enjoyed knitting them so much. I enjoyed wearing them and then somebody's husband threw them in the wash. So they're a little bit felted, but I can still get them on my feet. Um, they're very cozy, warm, deep winter, slouch around the house kind of socks now. <sighs> you know where this is going, except for the second sock, which has got a hole in two places. Do you just scrap them because they're so felted and awful? Do you turn them into soap sacks? What do you do with them? Because this sock is essentially okay. Do you resurrect this one with a patch? I don't have any of these yarns anymore. So it would have to be a patch of some sort of... <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. I'm likely to do it again. And then there's my third pair of socks. I don't know. I think these were among the very first socks I ever... I think these were the very first socks I ever knit. And I love them so much that they have been... Uh, they have been darned and darned and needing to be darned. And here, it's like a sock puppet show here. Um, darned and darned and um, darned. And then the darn is coming apart. What do I do with these? So these three pairs of socks have just been sitting in my sewing room waiting for me to decide what I'm going to do. This pair has the most damage. I mean, it's not got a pattern or anything. It just, oh, it's so tragic. But I love them. So what would you do? All those hours of knitting, which for me, you know, it, it's something I feel right now. I've got two pair of socks that I'm trying to make and I don't have time to get to them. So to throw this away represents hours and hours of precious free time. On the other hand, this these socks in particular, it's getting ridiculous, the number of darns. I don't know if I can. And I don't know if it's worth it just to hang on to the top and yeah, I don't know. Or again, I guess I could turn them into soap sacks or something. If you have any ideas about what you would do, let me know. Leave it in the comments. What do you do with your socks when you get holes in them? I would like to think that I'm a very thrifty person, and so I have no problem with darning them. 
and if the darn is going to be on the bottom or somewhere that I'm not seeing, I don't even care if it matches terribly much. I did, that just makes me happy. The thrifty part of my heart makes me happy. But these three pairs have been sitting in my sewing room probably for five years, and I haven't done anything with them. And when I have project bags full of new and fun ideas, maybe I don't spend any more time on them and I turn them into something else. I don't know. This fun project bag actually came from my cousin, with whom I will be going to Rhinebeck. Um, and I just love it. <laughs> Keep calm and carry yarn. I love it. Um, she got it in New York. I forget where. So, that's it for this episode. Um, I don't know when I'll be back. If I um, get back in September sometime, or early October, that will be a big win. <laughs> We've got school really gearing up. We don't have any major holidays or breaks between now pretty much and Thanksgiving. So hopefully I'll check in again before I get to go to Rhinebeck and um, let you know how it's going. But it may depend on how much time I find to knit, because if I don't have any knitting to show you, then what would be the point? Um, anyway, I hope you're well. Thank you very much for stopping by and um, hope to see you again soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.